Hi, welcome guys. Um, so my name's Stephen Armstrong. I'm Principal Automation Engineer at Paddy Power Betfair. And this is Dave Buckley, Infrastructure Automation Engineer at Paddy Power Betfair. Cool, so first off, just a bit about who Paddy Power Betfair are. Uh, we've actually only existed as a company for a couple of months. So this was the merger of Paddy Power and Betfair back in February. Uh, Steve and I come from the Betfair side, just so you'd like to forgive us if in this presentation we refer to Betfair as opposed to the rather wordy Paddy Power Betfair. Um, but yeah, so Betfair is famous for being an online sporting betting exchange. So it allows punters to bet against basically other people in the world uh, through an online uh, platform. Uh, so we've got some of the figures there which are just for Betfair to give a kind of scale of the sort of traffic we're receiving on the website. So we have 1.7 active users, 1.7 million active users, uh, getting up towards 150 million daily transactions. Uh, a lot of our a lot of our traffic goes through our API, and we're processing about 3.7 billion daily daily API calls. Um, and as you see at the bottom, there we've got details of the merger with Paddy Power in February. So we're now a FTSE 100 company, so one of the top 100 companies trading on the London Stock Exchange. Yes, so a bit about the stack. So what we've done is we've put together a Red Hat OpenStack implementation. So at the compute level, we have HP boxes. So they're our DL360 uh, Gen 9 boxes. So we run that for all our compute. Um, basically, at top of rack for networking, we use Arista. And then we've got our SDN controller, which is New Edge Networks. So in terms of Cinder integrate, we have pure storage, so that's our old flash solution. And then we use NetApp as well for our NFS requirements. Uh, in terms of monitoring the stack, we use Sensu. So uh, that hooks into Solometer as well. So if you just flip on. Okay, so a bit about uh, how we're actually running this in production. So we have an active, active data center. So coming in at the top, we have ultra DNS. So that allows us to basically balance traffic between DCs. So coming in at the top, you've got our SRX Juniper. So that's our external firewall. We then have two layers of uh, Citrix load balancers that come down. Uh, integrating with that, we've got Arista at top of rack with uh, our SDN controller with Nuage. Uh, we run two open stacks per DC. So we have one for our tooling and monitoring. And then the reason that uh, we then have our infrastructure OpenStack, which runs all our production workloads and all our test environments. So we chose to do that because we didn't actually want, um, if we had an issue with OpenStack, we wanted our monitoring to be in a separate OpenStack so that we could actually use it to monitor it accurately. Underneath that, you have all the compute, which is the HP stack. We run KVM for everything in terms of hypervisors, and we'll use the HP boxes for bare metal later on. We also have pure storage and NetApp, so that we use for our performance workloads. We have pure storage where we'll mount cinder volumes um, to give us a higher performance with all the flash solution. And then we're looking later on with NetApp to introduce Manila. So for our NFS. We have RDO installations to actually install it. So you've got one RDO installation per OpenStack. Okay. So what we really wanted to do and the driver behind this was to set up a self-service model. So each individual team will get their own tenant. So we wanted to give them the ability to click, create their own flavors and size the boxes the way they wanted. So Basically, they get to specify the CPU, RAM, and disk space for each of the VMs themselves. We wanted to give them a self-service model, so if they had an application that required bare metal, they can get that, and we're, we'll be utilizing Ironic for that. Or for the virtualized state, we will have KVM. Um, the other things that we wanted to do, and this was a new thing for, for Betfair, was we wanted to give teams the ability to set up and self-service themselves with their own firewall rules. So rather than having to wait for long week times for a network team to self-service that, we've put that in the hands of the developers. So they'll create all their ACL rules using Nuage. So um, yeah. The other thing that we've got as well is for load balancing. So we allow 
developers to swap in the boxes that they want, that they provision, onto VIPs and basically roll uh, releases through on the VIPs. Okay. So in terms of our tool chain, this is how it looks. So a developer will, or an engineer, or infrastructure engineer will come in, they will check changes into GitLab, that will trigger a continuous integration build on a Jenkins slave, that then rolls up into a manifest file that's pushed start to factory. And then basically ThoughtWorks go schedule this. So we use Ansible for our orchestration and then Chef for our configuration management server side. So um, we'll walk you through that workflow with a, a demo. So I won't go into too much detail just now. Okay. So how do teams actually integrate with the infrastructure? So we use Ansible, so it's a self-service file. So it's a static inventory file. So here in this example, you can see that teams will specify that they want five images. You can see that with the re 01 to 05. Uh, and then they specify on that same line item, they specify their flavor, so vCPUs, uh, RAM, RAM, and disk space. And then they specify the image that they want to use. So we offer for uh, our Linux stack, sent us six and seven images. And then we basically tag all the boxes with the particular run list. One of the things that we wanted to do was give uh, development teams uncontended uh, hypervisors and allow them to chop up the CPU the way they want. So those hosts there uh, that you can see um, basically are split between between racks, that's two hypervisors. So they actually specify uh, what hypervisor they place those VMs on. So we use the Nova scheduler rules to do that. Okay. So now it's demo time. So what we're going to do is walk through our workflow. So hopefully the demo gods are, are kind to us. We've run it 27 times already this morning. So hopefully 28 is lucky too. Okay, so starting off, we have our traditional uh, CI build. So we have our, in this instance, we're running Remin, so that's our TLE acronym. So if we just click on that, Dave. And basically what this does is it produces our RPM files that we're going to install in the box. So if you just drill through into Artifactory. So this has taken us into the Artifactory build browser at this point. So the build browser, you can actually see under publish modules, you can see that it's produced one artifact. So that's a specific RPM for that particular build. So if you just go through to show and tree, you can see that this is the folder structure. So all our builds, so 20, I think 34, 35, and 37, you can see here. And Okay, so if we just go back. So that's how we produce the application RPM. It's just a traditional CI build. And then what we wanted to do was correlate the chef recipe that we used to actually install that RPM. So if we just click through. So all we do at this point in this CI build is we actually just tag it in GitLab. So it's fairly simple there so that we correlate that RPM with the chef recipe. So if you just go back to it. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do was treat infrastructure as code. So we basically have our Linux CI build. So what this does is it actually produces a CentOS 6 and CentOS 7 image. So we use Packer for this, if you just go through it. So again, using the build browser. So this is all very simple. Go to publish modules. So you can see that we create a uh, 2 QCO images that we will then upload to, to Glance. So what we've done with this step is we've basically patched everything as part of the CI build, and we've, sent, we've basically hardened it, security hardened it, and we've quality scanned it as well. So when it goes out to uh, the delivery teams, it's all patched up to the latest level. OK, if we just go back. So the next thing in our step is our SDN. So this was new to Betfair, so we're utilizing NuAge for this step. So all that we're doing is we're tagging the specific ACL rules uh, at a particular point in time, and we're basically just using a GitLab label on that. So if we just go into the config, I'll just show you what that looks like. OK, 
Okay. So underneath Nuage, um, we have all the different teams, uh, different applications. So in this instance, if we just have a look under uh, Riemann, which we will be deploying today, uh, we've basically got the ACL rules. So if we just select the ACL rules, so what that does is for every single, single environment, you want it to be uh, a consistent set of ACL rules so that you test the same way as you in quality assurance environments as you do in production. Okay, so in this instance, it's fairly simple. So the developers would have to open up uh, any, any port 80. This is probably a bad example because we wouldn't allow that. Uh, in uh, reality, our rules are a bit more locked down. So what we do, if you just step back, we've got a common set of ACL rules that we apply on top of that. So basically, the common set of ACL rules will allow access to DNS and everything so that developers don't actually have to, um, to set this all up themselves. So they're only specifically con focusing on the application. So Nuage has a very good way of doing this. It uses network macros. So anything out, sitting outside the overlay network, you can actually integrate with. So for instance, if we've got applications that are sitting in our uh, native estate in Citrix N, we can basically just connect to them using network macros. Okay, so if we just go back to the Riemann SDN config. So another important thing that we've introduced here is we have uh, micro subnets. So if we just have a look at QA, so what we do now is r when we spin up boxes, we have AB subnets. So the first release will go into the A subnet, and then basically the second release will go into the B subnet. So we do a full teardown of uh, that particular network and subnet every time that we deploy. So that means the ACL rules are always up to date and we'll demo, demo that in a bit. So you can see that we've got a slash 26 micro subnet for each of them. So when we onboard Teams, they will just fill out these YAML files, which are just var files for Ansible. Okay, if we just step back. So that's all tagged at the specific version, so that's how SDN plugs in. Uh, the last one that we've got, well, second last one, actually, is our load balancer config. So basically, again, just tagging at a specific version in GitLab when there's changes to that GitLab repository. So if we just go to, um, yeah, just go to the load balancer project. So for developers, what we were trying to do is make this as consistent as possible. So where you had Nuage before, you've got Netscaler this time. And then underneath it, you've got the particular team. So in this instance, BF Re. And then if we just go into the QA one, you'll see that we specify all the Netscaler specific load balancing rules. So we've got our LBB server, uh, we've got our service, so we're serving the services on port 80. And then we've got a, our monitor, which does the health check in the boxes. And then we've got our service binding. One of the important points is at the bottom where you've got your role percentage. So Ansible allows you to do rolling updates in the box. So that'll take 50% box, uh, 50 of the boxes out of service, update them, and put, put them back on the load balancer. Okay. So the final one that we've got, before we kick off the pipeline, is our common workflow CI build. So what we wanted to do was have a centralized mechanism of where all teams spin up VMs in the same way, they create layer three networks in the same way, because we didn't want them to be running different snowflakes and different scripts. Um, so basically we provide uh, those set of common workflow actions, so we're just tagging that at a specific version as well. So how do we roll this all up together? So each particular TLA will have their own TLA package build, so that's the application package build. So if you just click on build with parameters, Dave. So you can see that basically what that's doing is it's pulling in all the different CI builds, at the different versions. So that's basically the trigger for the Riemann package build would be um, a developer check-in from the 
the Riemann CI build. So that would then roll up. Then it would consume everything else at the particular version. So this is just, as soon as they do a check-in, it will just roll up the next time that they deploy. So they'll just consume the network config, uh, the load balancing config, and any workflow actions that have been updated as well. So if we just go back. Yeah. So what, what that actually outputs is a simple JSON file. So the JSON file just has all the version, versioning in it. So basically it's just tagging. It's got all the tags of all the GitLab repositories. OK, so how does that roll up? So once that's actually um, triggered, just go back to it and go through to Artifactory again. So it goes through the build browser. So if you remember, we had ThoughtWorks Go that was basically polling. It pulls this repository, which is the release repository where all the manifest files sit. So if a brand new manifest file is generated, then that will trigger the pipeline. Okay. So ThoughtWorks Go is actually pulling this folder. So if you wanted to do a rollback, you roll back to the previous manifest file, which has all the, the code, the chef recipe, uh, your SDN config, your load balancing config, so your, and your platform template. So you're rolling everything back at that point. You're not just rolling code back because something might break. OK. So what we'll show is we'll kick off a package build, and then we'll go through. But before we do that, uh, we'll just show you that inventory file and how the teams actually integrate with it. So, for instance, a team that wanted to deploy their particular TLA, they would set up their, um, their, their package build and all their CI jobs. So we use Jenkins Job Builder for that. So everything's in source control. So everything that you've seen in, in, in Jenkins is in source control as well. And we're about to show you ThoughtWorks Go as well. So we have ThoughtWorks Go Pipeline Builder. So we build all of that from YAML too. But before that, so if a team wants to integrate with this, what they will do is they will specify in this cell service inventory file, they will specify a new line item for their particular deployment. In this instance, we have Riemann QA. So here, we're specified five boxes. Can you just highlight that, Dave? So this specifies five boxes. That's actually our naming standard. So that's the IE1 data center QA. And then we've got our, our flavor that they specify. So it's their vCPU, RAM, and disk space. And in this instance, they want to use the CentOS 6 image. So all the information on the version of that CentOS 6 image comes from the manifest file. So they don't need to fill that in. They just consume the latest and greatest. So what we do is we tag our boxes with the profile that we want. So when we spin up our VMs, we tag them with uh, the metadata, uh, and it basically specifies the run list. Then if we just go along, we specify uh, what hypervisors that you're going to deploy it on. So in production, we'd have two hypervisors so that if we had a rack failure, it would not take down the whole application. So we design the whole data center for, for failure. OK. So with that filled in, we're ready to kick off our package build. So this would automatically trigger. You wouldn't have to do this manually. OK. I'm just going to check. I'm signed into Horizon. Yeah. OK. So basically, you should see this trigger in a minute. So uh, there's a polling interval on ThoughtWorks Go, and then we should see it kick off. So if, yeah, I'll just wait a second. And it's probably going to take longer because uh, it's a demo. Come on, 28. It'll get there. Are you sure? This happens every time, I swear. <laughs> every time in front of an audience. Basically, it's got a minute polling interval. So sometimes you hit it spot on, uh, like that, you're there. Uh, other times, 
you wait for 60 seconds. One of those times seems to be now. Uh, Come on, Demo Gods. You can do it. There we Yay. go. Right. Thank so you. the first step of the pipeline is it downloads the manifest file. And what it will do is it will pull down from all the GitLab repositories and then basically assemble uh, Ansible var file structure. So then the common workflow actions, which are just Ansible playbooks, then run across that. So the second bit, uh, which is set up prerequisites OS, that's going to create our flavor and assemble our host aggregate. So we dynamically assemble uh, the host aggregates each time. OK, so we'll just wait till it gets to that step. So if we just go in to OpenStack at this point, so you'll see, so every part of this is completely immutable. We tear it down and then uh, bring it back up. So we're building everything from scratch each thing. So if we just go to the flavor, you'll see that as part of this, that's OK. Classic. <laughs> Yep, we generate the flavor. So it's a private flavor for each particular tenant. So this is all using the Ansible 2.0 modules, and we've wrote some uh, custom modules, but we'll take you through that later. So that's a private module for that particular tenant. We also assemble the host aggregate. So you'll see the particular hypervisor underneath it. So underneath that, you can see that that corresponds to the particular inventory file. So we use the extra specs uh, filter for this. So basically what we do is we tag that host aggregate with metadata that says, as you can see there, you've got TLA, IE, 1, Remin, QE, RE. The flavor is also tagged with that specific metadata as well. So if you spin up using that particular flavor, it will place the VMs on those particular particular boxes. That's kind of invisible to the end user, so all they care about is specifying what hypervisors that they, they want to assign. Okay, so we've slowed down this bit and put a manual step in because we always take too long at that step. That would normally just go straight through, but what I wanted to do was take you through Nuage before. Okay, so in Nuage, and again, we've got logged out. Unbelievable. It's good that it logs out, shows it's secure. <laughs> right, that was one for the security team. Okay, so basically at the moment you've got your, your B deployment sitting there. So what we're going to do is we'll push this on and it'll create the network. So we'll create our A network because it alternates between the two. Uh, if you just go into the network, Dave, and then show the policies, this is how Nuage works with the ACL policies. So you've got your ingress and egress rules. So Basically, for each of them, we just specify this. This corresponds directly to the, the new edge, uh, the OpenStack subnet, so it's a one-to-one -one mapping. And then you can see the common rules that we've seen before, and incremented on top of that, you've got the application-specific rules. Okay, so if you just kick on the pipeline. So we should see it pop up in a second. And then we'll actually see the VMs for the new release being placed into the subnet. Unless someone's stolen our Go agent. Yep, so you see the brand new network pop up. If we go into OpenStack, you will see the corresponding network, but we won't do that just now because we want to see the VMs pop up. So that's basically applied the brand new ACL policies to that particular subnet. So if you click back to the pipeline quickly, it should go on to the next point. Yeah, so go back to OpenStack. So we should see the boxes actually pop up now. So if you remember back to the inventory file, the static inventory file, we actually tag the boxes with the specific profile. So you should see them pop up in a second. Yeah, there you go. So they've all popped up. And then if we go to OpenStack, you'll see them corris the corresponding one underneath it. So 
So what we're going to focus on here, so that's just popped up. So you've got your five boxes. Uh, and you can see the particular naming standard with them as well. So if you just click through them. So the important thing to note down here is it's tagged the box with the run list. So what we then use is we use Ansible Dynamic Inventory on the chef run. So go back, it should have went on to chef run. So that's actually uses that tag to, to specify what chef recipe to actually execute on the box. So it pulls it from the metadata and opens that. So that's very important because we can basically just tag boxes with the profile, run it over, and basically install the software that we want on that. Okay. Um, other things to note is the way that we actually filter on the boxes, so just go to instances, Dave, is we tag them with, um, we've also got our sensor checks as well. So any checks that we're specified, we haven't actually specified any for this because it's just a test application, but we've got a subscription and check, so all monitoring is actually set up this way as well. So we use Ansible to tag everything on the box. So another important thing, the, um, the build ID on here as well is specified. So that allows us to make different decisions. So that's important when you want to actually roll boxes on and off of the load balancer. So we'll use Ansible to basically filter down. So you say, return me all the boxes in this group. So you've got the group there. And then you say, filter down, just give me the boxes with this specific build version. So anything not equal to that, roll it off the load balancer. So if we go back to the load balancer, that's still running chef. So this is a stage that varies per application. Yeah, so we're on to the create bit. So the create bit, what that'll do is go to the next scaler and actually set up uh, your VIP using those load balancing rules that we specified. So in this instance, we're doing round robin as you as the development teams would have specified in their, their config file. The rolling update then uses that Ansible dynamic inventory to basically filter on the boxes and then roll those particular boxes into service. So we had the 50% the roll rate, so roll those boxes off the load balancer. And then finally, we will clean up the previous version of uh, the subnet and the VMs. Generally, what we've got is we've got our testing in between that. So we've got a test phase where a test pack would actually run. OK, so that's doing the rolling update. And you can actually hit that particular VIP now. Yep, so that's basically how ugly Riemann looks, which is the, the test application that we've, we've launched. Okay, so that should be a zero downtime deployment as well, so it shouldn't affect live servers because you're doing that rolling update back to Nuraj. And what we should see is basically it'll kill all the VMs with the previous version and, um, and kill the subnet and then await for the next deploy. So it's just killed that and the subnet should follow in a second because we're cleaning up the ACL rules before, so that's why there's that slight delay. So it's that's it done. And then for the next bit, it's basically going to promote it onto the next stage of the pipeline. So if we go back to the package build, in a second you can see the promotion. So if you hover over, that's the previous build. So that went through QE. And it's then if you hover to the right, Dave, and that's went through to our integration environment. So in a second, with that promotion, you should see a star pop up. So developers can look at their package build and actually see what stage it's went through. And we actually associate, so it's just donated the star for the next stage. So if we go to, and what that then that will do is move the manifest to an, another folder location and the next stage of the pipeline will pull that and kick it off, okay? So that's our green pipeline. So the demo gods were good to us. And then basically the polling gods won't be good to us because um, that'll probably take a minute to pull in the next stage. And then that will go all the way through to production and that's how how they deploy. Okay. So I think we'll just wait for a second to show that going to the next stage. So I think at the next bit, what we will actually take you through is some of the that Ansible modules that we that we wrote and some of the contributions that we've done to the OpenStack community through 
through shade. Okay. I hope they'll believe us if we just go off this. Now. Fair enough. Yeah. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. It should deploy through. Okay. So, yeah, this was basically just the timing. So, end to end, that takes around seven minutes. Most of it is the chef run. And obviously, when you're demoing it, it seems like it takes a lot longer. Um, yeah, so that's all the stages. So, first stage, pull down all the prerequisites. Um, you then set up the flavor and host aggregate. You create the layer free network with your specific um, ACL rules. You then launch the VMs into that network. You then tag the boxes. Run Chef using that profile of the tagged boxes. You then create the VIP. Roll those boxes onto the VIP, rolling the previous version off. Clean up the previous version's VMs, ACL rules, and tear down the network, waiting for the next one, promoting it to the next stage. Can we flip back now and see if it went on? Yep. So there you go. It's triggered onto the next stage, and it's just going through the pipeline. OK, back to slides. So yeah, next slide. So Dave's going to take you through what we actually did um, with OpenStack and Ansible modules and some of the, the things that were solved using this methodology. Yep. Uh, I know we've not got too much time left, so I'll try to okay. speed through these. Um, so yeah, basically, as Steve said, we're using Ansible for all our orchestration um, through the pipeline. Um, so all the interaction with OpenStack is done through Ansible modules. Uh, we like Ansible because it's open source, it's easy to use. Um, so basically we've got a real mix in that for some, for some operations we're, we're using directly the Ansible core upstream modules. For some things we found that we've had to patch modules, uh, create our own custom ones based off the upstream version, and in some cases as well just made our own from scratch. Uh, using the shade Python shade library. Um, so yeah, basically we have a, in that pipeline, every single stage was basically a running an Ansible playbook. Uh, so we're using that to create the VMs, create the host aggregates, arrange the hypervisors into the host aggregates, and then do the teardown of the VMs as well. Okay. So yeah, advantages of this, uh, we're treating infrastructure as code, everything's source controlled, everything's tagged and versioned, which does helps with the rollback, as Steve described earlier. Uh, we have the self-service model, so teams create their own flavors. They want to increase the number of vCPUs. They just have to fill in a, a config file and then redeploy their application. Um, so there's absolutely no wait time on, you know, you're not waiting for a ticket to be, to be uh, completed by the infrastructure team. And you can scale down and scale up at will just by changing the number of boxes in that config file. We also use the notion of a availability zone in OpenStack to segregate our test environments. So QA is completely separate from our integration environment, completely separate from our production environment. And because we're, we're using the same playbooks to deploy in all those environments, it means we're confident that by the time we get to production, because everything's been deployed in the same way, you can be confident that there's, there's no problems with your, with your code. Uh, a bit about the image automations. This is how we, we basically have a pipeline to create our Linux and Windows uh, images, uh, which get pushed up to uh, OpenStack Glance. Um, again, as Steve said, we're using the Packer, the Packer uh, builder by HashiCorp, which is really cool. So basically, we have a Kimu builder uh, plugin for Packer. So we run that on a hypervisor where we have a nested virtualization enabled. So that enables us to build those base images. And then we then use the OpenStack Builder plugin to basically spin up instances off those images in OpenStack. We run Chef on them to install all the prerequisites that we need on those images. And then the images that get generated from, from that deployment are uh, uploaded to Glance in the four clouds across our two DCs. Again, infrastructure is code. Everything's source controlled. This is a really big thing for us so that when you roll back, you're rolling back absolutely everything. Um, it's completely automated, so teams teams will just consume the latest version that is successfully latest version of the image that is successfully passed the past the pipeline. And there's no in-place patching whatsoever, so all the patching is automated in that pipeline. Um, so yeah, teams don't have to worry about that either. They'll just consume consume it in place as is. Okay. And we also have the security hardening on that pipeline as well. 
So yeah. one of the end user benefits is that basically teams get a VM in 10 seconds for Linux. You have to wait a little bit for Windows, a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, no patching and scripting to applications. So it's all about the devs. The devs are our end users, and we're trying to make life easier for them. So the SDN, again, it's a similar theme. So in this case, uh, there are no Ansible modules for, for Nuage. Um, so one of our guys, Mario Santos, uh, has, has been an absolute machine and wrote about 43 Ansible modules using the, uh, there's a Nuage Python SDK. So essentially wrapping, uh, writing a wrapper around those. So this carries out all the orchestration in Nuage so to create subnets, to create ACL rules. Uh, we also have a day one playbook that effectively builds out Betfair's estate. So if we ever lost a data center or we moved into a new data center, we'd just be able to run this playbook and generate all our Nuage domains and basically redeploy uh, our entire estate um, within minutes, I guess. Yep, second. seconds. Seconds, yep. good claim. And benefits again, infrastructure is code, teams can view their ACL rules. Um, so it gives us some insight into what applications are actually talking to each other, because I know in the past that's been a bit, bit of a black box for the devs at Betfair. Um, and again, you have easy audibility of those rules. So we have a, by default, we have a, a basically a denial on Nuage, and then you basically open up the specific ACL rules you need. So everything is blocked except for what applications need to talk to one another on what ports. And again, yeah, for the load balancer, it's a similar thing. We have network as code. Uh, so we've, we've got 38 modules, not quite as many as Nuage, but to carry out the, the creation of all the objects on the load balancer um, and basically do that, create, creating the BIP and the rolling update in our pipeline. And again, all those big thing, key thing for Ansible is that you make all those modules idempotent. So that ensures that what you have in source control in your config files completely, exactly matches what you have deployed in production and in your testing environments. So yeah, it's a similar, similar theme again. Treat infrastructure as code, version everything, um, and make basically enable clear visibility into what, is, what first seems like a complex, complex network structure we have at Betfair. Um, and now we're source controlling all that, giving visibility to the devs, to all the infrastructure guys. Um, and yeah, so they can understand network changes. Sorry. That's cool. the end of that. uh, so just taking you through what's next for us. So we're basically nailed down our, our VM workflow. So we're going to be looking at our ironic bare metal provisioning. We're also going to look at offering a container as a service offering to, to devs. So we'll be looking at Kubernetes for that. One of the things, because we've been rapidly doing this, we've basically done all of this in, in six months. Uh, so it's been a fairly rapid rise. So we want to take some time and basically open source everything that we've done. So we've already done some peer reviews for the Nuage modules. We'll be looking to talk to Citrix to do the same for the, the load balancing modules and basically everything else that we've done for Ansible Shade, we'll be looking to put back to the community. In terms of next steps as well, we're going to be looking at Nuage Networks for our third party uh, VPN so that can bring it into a, a layer three network. So we're waiting on the Nuage upgrade for that. Uh, also, as mentioned before, we're heavily using NetApp for NFS, so we're looking at uh, Manila project for that too. Okay. So I just wanted to give a shout out to all these people because without them it wouldn't be possible. So thanks to our Red Hat guys, um, our New Edge guys, and the guys from Computer Center as well in terms of vendors. And thanks to everyone at Betfair that, that made that possible. So I won't go through all the names because I think we're running out of time. But uh, yeah. OK, so the next point is questions. So as you can see, Dave had some fun with his cowboy hat there in Texas. Uh, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, if you want to take to the right. I'm not sure how much time we've got left, though. I can't even see up here either. So. <laughs> Uh, for the new OS, uh, what product in particular you use? Do you use the VIS? Um, for new edge? Yeah. So we use the VSD, VSC, VSG. Okay, so it's not VRM. the VIS that... Um, yeah, we use the VRS. VIS, well. okay. yeah. uh, any reason why you don't use the REST API instead of using Python SDK? So the SDK, basically everything's written in Ansible, and that's Python-based. So we 
basically what the the Python SDK is is just wrapped REST calls anyway. So people like Python because it's awesome. <laughs> OpenStax Python, right? <laughs> so six months. Yeah. You put this process together. So what is your what is your development methodology within the DevOps team? Um, in terms of development methodology, what we do is we don't have a DevOps team. So essentially, we, what we do is we try and facilitate um, the relationship between the devs so it makes it easy to consume. So this is just a self-service model. So one of the drivers for this was basically to give the devs AWS-like ability. Otherwise, they'll just go to to public cloud, so it had to be easy for them. One of the things that we've done with this is use the same principles that devs normally use to actually interact with code. So it makes it easy for them, so it's quite native, so filling in config files wasn't, wasn't difficult for them. Um, and basically using GitLab's second, second nature, so that was one of the main drivers on it. Uh, in terms of collaboration, we're running an onboarding process, so Basically, we work in an agile method. So recently, what we've had is some of our, our teams have basically came in for a two-week sprint to onboard their application. And I think we've got some examples of that as well. So we've got our Exchange mobile site that's running on OpenStack. And also, we've got our, our CBR application. So we're in the first phase of this. So about 10 different applications are going to go on, on there in the next month or so. Uh, but we're throttled traffic through the platform, and it's, it's going well. So basically, we switched the MS on our Exchange Mobile site and did uh, a quarter of a million transactions in a two-hour period. And uh, the performance that we're getting out of the network is pretty phenomenal, which is down to, to Arista and uh, Nuaj with our leaf spine topology. So I'd recommend it to anyone. Anything else? What do you guys do for your net? Uh, network, underlay network, and how do you guys provision the switches? And um, So basically, we use Arista Zero Touch provisioning for it. So we've got Z ZTP uh, that we use for that as well. Um, so essentially, as well, we use Red Hat uh, Director. So basically, we're looking to, we've done some customizations to that to deploy our, our uh, leaf spine topology in the network. And so we use RDO to scale out all our hypervisors as well. Anything else? <coughs> Any other questions afterwards? Just come and grab us. So, okay, uh, one so, more. So what do you guys use for uh, troubleshooting and things like that? What happens when things <coughs> go wrong? When you're provisioning this stuff and things go wrong, what's your... So, um, yeah. Recovery model, I guess. Yeah. So, basically, that's what's been very important for us is Ansible <laughs> 2.0. So, what we do is we use the block rescue functionality in that. So, if you think about it, we've got the clean down. So, if we have a failure, we basically just rescue it and then it'll, it'll tear it down. And then we'll do root cause analysis away from the particular environment. So, uh, we build that into our common workflow actions to do proper cleanup as well. All good. Well, thank you very much for allowing us to present today. Thank you. <laughs>